Welcome to this clinical review. Today, we're dissecting a prospective study that gets right to the heart of a common decision we all make in trauma surgery, whether or not to use distal interlocking screws for stable intertrochanteric fractures. So, let's dive right in. The big question, the one that Hedge and colleagues tackled head-on, is pretty simple. When you're using a long cephalomedullary nail for these stable fracture patterns, is distal locking actually necessary? All right, here's how we're gonna break it down. We'll look at why this is a question in the first place, then get into the study's methods. After that, we'll dig into the outcomes, both in the OR and long-term, and finally, wrap up with what this all means for our practice. Okay, first things first, let's set the stage here. Why is this even a debate? What's the clinical thinking behind this investigation? So we're talking about your classic stable intertrochanteric fracture. Think of an AO slash OTA type 31A1. Nowadays, a long nail like the PFNA2 is a pretty standard go-to. But the real question is, for these specific inherently stable patterns, do we really need that extra rotational and axial stability from a distal lock? And here's the crux of it. Look, for an unstable fracture, it's not even a discussion, right? You have to lock distally to prevent collapse or rotation. But for stable patterns, is that lock actually providing a benefit? Or are we just adding OR time, increasing radiation exposure, and maybe even introducing new complications? That's the clinical equipoise that makes a study like this so valuable. So now, let's get into the nitty gritty. How did these investigators actually set up their study to answer this question? They ran a prospective comparative study following 58 patients over a two-year span. And the fact that its perspective is chi here, it means the data collection was planned from the start, which really cuts down on bias and makes the findings we're about to see much more robust. They split patients into two clear groups. Group A, with 31 patients, got the standard procedure, a long PFNA II with distal locking bolts. Group B, with 27 patients, got the same exact nail, but no distal lock. That was the only variable, which is exactly what you want to see. And check this out. This is why their comparison is so strong. The patient demographics were incredibly well matched. You can see the p-values for age, gender, and side are all high, meaning there were no statistically significant differences between the groups at the start. That gives us a really solid foundation to say that any differences in outcomes were due to the intervention itself. Okay, now for the part we've all been waiting for, the results. Let's start in the operating room and look at the hard numbers. And the first major finding is a big one, operative time. The unlocked group averaged just 77 minutes compared to over 107 minutes for the locked group. That's a full 30 minutes shaved off the procedure. And with a p-value less than 0.001, that difference is highly statistically significant. The story is just as dramatic when you look at fluoro time. Radiation exposure was nearly cut in half in the unlocked group. We're talking from almost 79 seconds down to 40. Again, a highly significant finding and one that matters for the safety of everyone in the OR. So you save time, you cut down on radiation. What's the catch? Well, here's the really interesting part. At one year, there was no catch. Functionally, the patients did just as well. The mean Harris HIP scores were virtually identical, and that p-value of 0.374 tells you there's no statistical difference at all. Both groups had good outcomes. So if function is the same, what about the x-rays? Does leaving out the lock, making the construct more dynamic, change how the fracture actually heals? Let's take a look. This is pretty striking. At the three-month mark, the unlocked group showed significantly faster healing. Over 92% of those patients had radiological union, compared to just under 68% in the locked group. That difference was statistically significant. But here's the crucial follow-up to that. While locking seems to delay that early consolidation, likely by creating a much stiffer construct, it doesn't prevent union in the long run. By six months, 100% of fractures in both groups were fully healed. Now, when we look at complications, a clear pattern jumps out. All the issues related to distal hardware, irritation, knee pain, swelling, they only happen in the locked group. Now, the patient numbers are small, so this didn't hit statistical significance, but the clinical signal is pretty hard to ignore. In fact, some of those patients in group A actually needed another surgery just to have their distal bolts taken out. All right, let's put it all together. What are the big actionable takeaways from this study that we can bring into our own practice? The study's authors are incredibly direct in their conclusion. Based on their perspective data, they state it plainly. For this fracture with this implant, 
distal locking is not required. So let's just run through the list of advantages again. By omitting the distal lock, you significantly cut OR time and radiation exposure. You appear to get faster early healing, you completely avoid that specific set of hardware complications, and you do all of that with absolutely no compromise to the final union rate or the patient's functional outcome. It's a pretty compelling argument. Which leaves us with a really provocative question to think about in our own work. In light of prospective evidence like this, we have to critically reevaluate the routine use of distal locking for stable patterns. We have to ask ourselves, what specific feature, clinically or on an x-ray, would make us decide to add that step back into the procedure? Definitely some food for thought.